Hey, we're here today with Jason Prindle talking about enterprise sales development. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Eric. How about yourself? Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, we're really looking forward to this conversation. Jason, tell us a little bit about the team that you have over at Big ID, which you just joined, you know, uh, kind of end of last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about 10 months ago, I joined the team um, here at Big ID. So uh, I inherited five SDRs that were kind of already up and running, um, but lacked a lot of uh, process, a lot of direction and, and direct leadership. So that's where they kind of went out looking for somebody like myself. Um, our goal was to grow it very, very fast and uh, and keep up with the growth of the company. So we started with those five. I've promoted all five of those people to different roles. Now we're up to a team of about 20 SDRs. We have one SDR manager that we've added. Um, and I've also spun up our inside sales team here. So we have Three of those original five SDRs have been promoted to sales, and, and we're working to launch some new products, some kind of mid-market and, and uh, a little lower investment from dollar and time uh, standpoint products. That's fantastic. Amazing. 4X growth, too, on the SDR front. Yeah, um, yeah. It's been crazy, but, but exciting at the same time. Seriously. Tell yeah. me a little bit about Big ID. In fact, give us your pitch. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, Big ID, we are a data security, data privacy, data governance company. Um, we start with our discovery foundation, which really helps businesses find their uh, PI, PII, and sensitive data that they have about their customers, employees, etc. cetera. Um, and then we build from there. So we like to say, like, first, you have to know where it is. And a lot of large enterprises don't know where all that data is. So our discovery foundation with some AI and machine learning helps them find that data faster and better than anybody else. And then on top of that, we build out uh, a marketplace of apps to allow companies to decide, you know, are they are they looking to mature in the security pillar or the privacy pillar or governance pillar and really kind of uh, uh, pick their adventure from there, right? So we start, like I said, with that with that base and then and then build from there. That's great. And um, tell me a little bit about your ideal, you know, customer or client pri profile. Um, yeah. And how you built that out? Yeah. Kind of map. Sure. Product. Yeah, classic, um, classic big ID. Uh, and I say classic because of, as I mentioned, with the inside sales team, we've released some new products to address some new markets. But um, big ID enterprise or big ID at its core has been targeting really those global 2000 large enterprises, names that you know, um, type of companies that have a ton of data. So obviously we play well or sensitive data, I should say. So obviously we play well in regulated industries as well as industries like retail, where you know, you have large, large retailers who have millions upon millions of customers, and, and that turns into billions of pieces of data on those customers. Um, some of our newer products that we've released, uh, Small ID, right, clever name, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and another one called BigID.me, uh, which is more for the consumer side, those have been released, and those were targeting towards the mid-market or the commercial size companies. So we've drawn that at the 100 to about 500 million in revenue in yearly revenue type companies. And that's where we're targeting uh, those particular products as well. And how do you think about the kind of the title cluster of the folks that you're looking to start conversations with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we look at them as heads of. So we say heads of privacy, heads of data, heads of, of security. You know, those titles can take on a bunch of different uh, uh, a bunch of different forms. Very similar to SDRs or business development reps or, or whatever, right? You call the same thing nine different things depending on who you're talking to. So we really look at those heads of. A lot of times in these larger organizations, their data team um, has matured a little bit. So you have your chief data officers, chief privacy privacy officers, things like that. Um, but, um, you know, a lot of a lot of what we do, and especially from the SDR work as we're targeting these accounts is, is first, we kind of have to understand who are these groups and, and are they siloed classically, like we would think they are? Or do they have multiple uh, responsibilities? And then what are the titles of, of people that actually hold things and, uh, and, and own these types of projects? Um, you know, we find it, I find it pretty funny that sometimes, you know, we could talk to a CISO and, and he's our big decision maker and he's the one we want to talk to. Uh, other times we talk to another CISO and, and he or she really has nothing to do with the particular project. So a lot of it is we have to understand each 
each company um, and and how they how they address this because it is it is newer. Um, you know, data has been around for a long time, but a focus on the security and privacy of that data is relatively new, as we can see by a lot of the regulations that are coming out or being talked about. So those organizations are new and they've kind of been built from within. And so each one is a little bit unique and a little bit different. It's, you know, it's not like a sales org where you kind of have your your SDRs and your sales folks and your VPs and your SVP and CRO, and you, you kind of know what that map generally looks like. When you're defining those groups and when you're defining the internal landscape of, of your targets, do you find that you get that information better through research in advance or are you having your SDRs make the calls and actually ask the questions to figure that out? Yeah. So we're right now we're having our SDRs make the calls and try to figure that out and map that out and, and ask a little bit about, um, you know, who's involved in these projects and what are the next steps and what does that decision process look like and, and things like that to try to map it out as early as we can. We are actually going to experiment with bringing on some research assistants, which we're actually in the middle of doing that right now. Um, and those research assistants would then be in charge of doing that mapping, whether they do it, you know, via tools like Lucia or, or Zoom Info and LinkedIn Sales Navigator, or they do it through calls and emails um, um, or, you know, referrals or, or what have you, right? So um, we're going to kind of task that team with a lot of that pre-work. So we understand who we're trying to call in each organization. And so our SDRs aren't wasting time targeting a couple of titles that may have nothing to do with what we want in that particular organization. Oops, Interesting. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about kind of like the way in which you have your team mapped and, and growing. I'm thinking that there's probably a case where now that you're supporting big ID, small ID, big ID.me, um, does the SDR team have a footprint in all? Mm -hmm. um, as of right now, we don't. Um, plans in the future are definitely to expand the SDR team into that mid-market commercial team. It's a little too early. And, and I say they don't have enough opportunities yet to really keep their day full so they can prospect as well for themselves. Um, but the way we have the sales territories uh, lined up are, um, it, it's it's multiple tiers of, of um, um Alignment, sorry, uh, that's probably a place they're going to want to edit, but multi multiple tiers of alignment where we start with target accounts. We brought in a lot of sales reps that have experience in this industry and they have connections uh, within certain accounts. Uh, then then some vertical stuff, right? So we have some healthcare, we have some FinServe, we have some um, kind of segmentation like that. And then it kind of rolls down to a, a, a geographical territory as well. So with that, you know, the, the idea behind hiring the sales team the way that they've hired over the past year is to bring in those people with those relationships so we can get some quick wins and we can introduce what we've what we're doing and 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 uh, you know kind of kind of get in a little bit faster than a normal ramp of an enterprise sales rep would be um, with that it comes with these dynamics where you know some people we know some people over here and over here so you can't just say hey you know Minnesota is your territory uh, um, we have to be a little more uh, a little more flexible with that. So what we've done on the SDR team to match that is really just aligned to a sales rep. Right. So an SDR team, we don't have a, a territory whatsoever. Um, you know, one of my SDRs could get leads from California Healthcare and from Austin, you know, Enterprise. It's just based on who they're aligned to. Um, of course, we do our best to try to keep those alignments either within the same vertical or within the same geographical territory to make it a little bit easier for the SDR. But, you know, uh, in a in a young company like we are, everything can't be always perfect. So we have, um, you know, we have some that's that's a little all over the place, but that's what we're doing right now. It's just matching that two to one ratio that we're trying to keep of one SDR to two enterprise sales reps. And as the team grows, we can simply hire another SDR, plug them in to match with the two new sales reps and, and continue to go that way. Um, 
looking towards the future, which I think, you know, we're obviously always having to do um, solve the problem now, but also solve the problem 12 months from now is uh, we would look to one, add some people to that, uh, to that commercial team and talking about those uh, less expensive kind of lower market products um, and treat that almost like a junior SDR role. Um, and then we could promote to the senior SDR role where they would align to enterprise. Um, and then, you know, like I said, we have the inside sales team as well. So now we can promote to that inside sales team um, and, and really create that. Um, uh, I know this is a little off topic, but, but create that career path for SDRs as well. That uh, makes perfect sense, actually. And so tell me, how did you come about the ratios that, that you've implemented mm -hmm. like now? Yeah. So we originally started with three to one, which I think is kind of a classic, you know, three to one ratio in, in the SDR world. So not reinventing the wheel there. Um, but what we found out pretty early on was that um, we had a great problem to have, which was that marketing was generating a ton of inbound leads for us. And at that three to one ratio, the SDRs really didn't have any time for that outbound prospecting, which I think is very, very important. You know, you have to have a good balance. Um, and we didn't have that balance. So we, we kind of looked at the lead flow, um, you know, how many leads were coming in per sales rep or per territory um, and um, and then kind of taking a look at, okay, how many steps do we need to complete to engage with these people? How much time do we spend on it? So how much of our time is spent on inbound? And we kind of came to a, a work hours type of figure and the math just worked that, hey, if we just simply added or, or you know, lowered that ratio by one to one to two, that would give us that good 50-50 split of inbound. 50% uh, of your time is on inbound and kind of the easy layups. And then 50% of your time is spent on target outbounding. And so you have that coverage going on where your SDRs are, are touching both inbound and outbound prospecting. Yeah, we do. Um, I think it's, you know, I've, I've toyed in the past with the idea of splitting those two up. I think with what we do and, and the market that we go after, and I found this in my previous um, two places as well, because it was kind of similar ICP, you know, is in kind of the same cybersecurity bubble-ish, right? Um, what we found was that... Um, um, I apologize. Pause for a second. I kind of, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, oh, with the split roles. Okay, sorry. Start over again here. So what we found with the with the split roles idea is that a lot of our outbound is really more on the demand gen side than it is uncovering open opportunities. You know, when we have an ASP around. $300,000 and we have a sales cycle around six, seven months, uh, as well as the, the infrastructure and the staffing uh, requirements that are, that are required to spin up a solution like ours, you don't trip into that or you can't, you can't really like throw a value statement and grab some interest and it converts into an opportunity right away on outbound. You're going to do that from time to time, but most of the time, the idea that we have is that we need to raise awareness of what we do and how we do it and why we do it better so that that when these conversations do start happening at that place, we're, we're top of mind. Um, with that methodology, a lot of outbound work turns into inbound. And, and so when we toyed with it a little bit at Beyond Trust, when I had a little bit bigger team and we kind of toyed with that separation uh, of inbound and outbound reps, we found that we were running into a lot of conflicts with an inbound rep getting a, you know, getting a lead calling out, booking the meeting, converting the opportunity, you know, getting paid for it. And the outbound rep saying, hey, I, I prospected them six months ago or five months ago. You know, uh, th this should be mine. And, and we were creating a lot of conflict where they didn't need to be. So I think from a philosophical standpoint, I've kind of backed away from that separation. And I think that, you know, if you get an SDR that is going to work in the role for about 18 months, it's about an 18 month job in, in my mind. Um, you know, their first six months or first three months are going to be ramp and that can be covered by inbound. The next three months after that is inbound with a little bit outbound, right? Some of those lucky ones you fall into or some of those people who are willing to take a meeting and kick the tires a bit. Um, and then your your second kind of uh, or, or your your second two thirds there, the, the, the hard work that you did on outbound starts paying paying you back. And then you have a good flow of what you started when you were ramping coming back around as either inbound or they're engaging with you now or, or what have you. 
Yeah, I'd love to ask a question about, you talked about having SDRs assigned directly to sales reps and sure. how they communicate with each other. And I, I would hope to ask a little bit more about that. Mm-hmm. How do they communicate with each other? Are they having daily one-on-ones? Are they meeting about each account separately? Um, do they have shared documents? You know, communication mm-hmm. between sales and SDRs is always a big question for a lot of our clients and the people that listen to these, these podcasts. So yeah. do you have any tips, tricks, uh, home-built processes? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, to, uh, I I've been, I've been recently trying to find if there's like a, a software solution to this where, you know, everybody could come in and, and we could share information and kind of create tasks for each other and do this whole thing. And, and there is nothing. And, and I've actually talked to a few people that joke like, Hey, maybe you should, you should start something. And I'm like, well, I have no idea how to code anything. So that's, that's not a great uh, start for me, but yeah, what we're doing now um, that I think has worked really well is we have at least a, a minimum of a weekly one hour touch base between the SDR and their rep. Um, we have target account lists, which are unfortunately in shared Google sheets right now. Um, and we've set, uh, I've set a specific agenda for those to say, okay, here's the things we need to go over. We need to go over the meetings that have happened over the last week. We need to see which of those can convert into opportunities. We need to see, um, you know, feedback on any of the meetings that didn't or why and kind of understand what, what the SDR did wrong. And then we have to, uh, decide what are going to be the next targets for the next week or for the next 30 days. Um, part of what we're moving towards and what I'm implementing is account-based sales development model, um, which has been talked about a little bit out there, you know, in, in the forums and things like that. Um, but it's really uh, allowing us to, to spend time. And one of these agenda points is decide who you're going to target in the next 30 days, right? 10 to 15 companies, you're going to have, you know, 10, 15, 20 contacts that you can go after. That should fill up your 30 days. But then what do we know about those accounts and what intelligence can we get from the research team as well as what information or what intelligence does the uh, does the sales rep know about those, the sales VPs, and then even some of our uh, subject matter experts, you know, our, 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 our CISO or CSO is also our security subject matter expert and, and bringing in the team and into those to say, okay, here's the targets. Now, what do we want to know? And, and I like three levels of, of customization or three levels of information there, which is one, just generically, what do we know about that account, right? What is PayPal or Nike or Coca-Cola or whomever? What are they, what are they doing? What is, has there been MA activity? Have they have they had a breach lately? If, you know, what's the news about that company that we can understand? Then um, um, you know, what do we understand about those particular profiles or, or ICPs? And then what do we know specifically about those people? And a lot of time, the connections that we have helps drive that conversation because our CSO might know their CISO or our sales rep has sold to them in the past and they know this person and that person. So um, for the account-based model, I know this is a long way to get around to the answer, but for that account-based model, we have to have that interaction. Otherwise, the SDRs don't have all the information they need to be as customized and be as personalized as we want them to be. So, um, so like I said, boil it down very easy, at least a weekly one-on-one uh, with them. I've set an agenda that I give to the sales rep and that I give to the SDR to say, these are the topics that you need to talk about. Um, and then, you know, I come back around the other side and one-on-ones with the SDRs and ask them how those conversations went and what information did they get? And, you know, what did, what happened, what was talked about all of that. So I can continue to reinforce those things as well well. Um, It's not revolutionary, you know, it's kind of the same of of what's been done, but I haven't found, I haven't found anything that, if I'm being honest, that has worked any better than than kind of the classic, just make sure that those meetings happen and, and make sure that you're telling them and, and, um, um, you know, setting the expectation of what's going to be talked about. So everybody comes prepared, and the time is well spent instead of just, you know, 20 minutes of, you know, blah, 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 about the dog and the kids. And, and then, you know, you don't get to what you wanted to get to. And, and how do you kind of pack that meeting itself um, to, to ensure that there is substance that you can credibly promise to the CISOs or, you know, big titles, heads of mm-hmm. um, that you're targeting? So uh, the meetings that we have, I'm sorry, just clarification. Yeah, so the just like that we the, have the kind the of messaging that your SDRs are using. Yeah. around why it's going to be worth, you know, the CISO at, at Nike's time to sit down and, and, and learn more. 
Yeah. So through those, through those conversations and that pre-work, we want to be able to have, like I said, those three levels of customization. So when we go out and we're sending a CDO at Pepsi a message, we're putting something in there that has something specific about Pepsi. If we, if there's something in the news or something that we know about through uh, one of our, one of our internal folks or something like that. And we do that level of customization, like I said, at the company level, at that title or that target level and then specific to that person. And we're not talking about like, hey, knowing that the person likes to golf and saying, you know, something like that. Uh, or I alma think, mater or what, what Yeah, I, I think that level of personalization is honestly kind of played out. Um, and I don't know that it really works that well. I, me personally, I, I get annoyed if, if someone says something about the school I went to, or, you know, I've got a quote from Yoda in my LinkedIn profile, like, sometimes I kind of appreciate the effort, but it's like, eh, it's not really moving the needle. I want to know what you're doing for me in my role to make my life easier. And I think that's real, what's really important. So we're crafting those messages by one, determining what information we need to know and have that information to craft the messages. And then um, we're spinning up a content team. I've tasked my new uh, SDR manager with this. We're, cr we're creating a content team, which is something I had previously at Beyond Trust as well, um, where we have a couple people from marketing, a couple of SDRs, and a couple of sales reps who come together and say, okay, you know, if we're talking to a CDO at a retail company or something like that, this is what's important to them. And, and we have our subject matter expert there to say, yeah, this would resonate with me or this wouldn't, or I wouldn't read this or I do. So a lot of it is crafted, uh, you know, amongst sales and marketing and, and SDRs to decide like, okay, here's a, here's a good, you know, these are some bullet points we want to talk about and, 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 and here's some good stuff about our product and what matters to them. And then, you know, we slow down and we personalize based on that person, but then we also run that by our subject matter experts, our SMEs to say, would you read this? Um, you know, do you, would, would this be interesting to you or not? Or are we missing here? Um, um, and so that's kind of where we start. And then with the content team, as we continue to grow that and mature that process a little bit, obviously, there'll be a lot of uh, going back and looking at what has the highest reply rates and click through rates and, and where in the sequences that we run are, are, are people engaging with us so we can look at what that content is or what that mixture was at that particular time of, of omni-channel outreach to, to really then start to tweak and make sure that we were hitting uh, with the most impactful stuff at the right time. That was a you you mentioned answer. the content team, <laughs> Thanks, and it sounds like this is the the second go round. Yes, um, what an idea that by the sounds of it was very successful at Beyond Trust. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about kind of what inspired you to to arrange your organization in that manner, and yeah. kind of like how you evolved that role. So that now you bring it to Big ID and are starting to introduce it in the exact same way. Sure, yeah, so this was really born, um, it was born over a barroom argument with my chief marketing officer. So um, <laughs> we were at, I, I can't remember, RSA, Black Hat, one of the big shows, right? And, and we were sitting at a bar and we had an event coming up in like an hour, but we were having a couple of pre-drinks and just uh, just kind of you know shooting the stuff. Um, and, uh, Somehow it came up, it talked about that, you know, we weren't using the emails that marketing put together. And I turned around and I told him, marketing emails are garbage for prospecting. And, and you know, we kind of looked at me and I was like, listen, you guys make it real pretty. Yeah, I know, right? Sorry, sorry, Eric. But, you know, the marketing emails are very pretty. They have lots of graphics and they have formatting that's kind of sometimes in the form of a JPEG or whatever. They don't get read. They're too long. They're too verbose, you know, et cetera, right? It doesn't work for prospecting. So I said to him, I said, what I do is I take your emails or, or the marketing emails that I get, I'd usually chop them up into three or four emails that are good for prospecting. And I strip out all the pretty, I chop up some of the content, add a little bit and I send it off. And, um, you know, he said, well, why don't, instead of you doing that, why don't you and a couple people from the marketing team get together and, and just work on, on writing those together. So we're not wasting time writing something that you're not going to use and you're not wasting time having to redo what we do. And, and that was kind of the aha moment. Like, you know what, that would be great. Um, 
And so we, we, we had a couple of meetings and I said, you know, I should bring in some of the sales reps here because I was relatively new at Beyond Trust when this happened. And previous to that, I hadn't been in cybersecurity before, a kind of general technology um, um, type of sales. So I, I knew a lot about Acer monitors and HP printers and, and Office 365, but I didn't know cybersecurity very well. And so um, I thought, you know, we've got a couple of reps at this company that have been here like 10 years you know, they're killing it, they're crushing quote all the time, you know, they know what their customers want, why don't we loop in a couple of those people? Um, and so we looped in a couple of sales reps, and it just kind of organically grown, grew from there, uh, with people wanting to be a part of it, because they were seeing what we were spitting out was a lot better than what they had seen in the past. And they wanted their input, you know, and, and, and I think, if you have the right type of sales team, it's really great to get that engagement. Like I want my SDRs to be better because they understand a better SDR means more money for them in the, in the long run. Um, so that's, that's where it started. And then we just continued to make little tweaks and, and find out, you know, uh, we actually had to uh, kind of cut some people out of the, out of the, out of the team. Cause they, you know, they were going in a different direction or, or they were very, very like, you know, my idea is right and nobody else's is right. And, and so we had to cut some sales reps and cut some marketing people and, and fill in with some other people. But we just grew it from there. And what we were finding was significant upticks in the engagement rates that we had on, on everything, right? And we were using this team, not just to create like full emails, but even little snippets we could uh, in, uh, inject into emails, call scripts, LinkedIn scripts, um, you know, all of our, all of, all of the ways that we try to um, um, reach our customers, even video scripts, you know, that we would use before we would um, cut a video. Uh, we, we had that team together. And then the, new, the latest iteration of that was, was bringing in those people that within our company would be the, the targets that we would be going out to. So speaking to the CTO and, and the CIO and those types of people and saying, hey, would this, would this resonate with you? And, and we found that that, again, kind of gave us another big jump um, because our best laid plans you know, the, the CISO read it and said, like, no, I wouldn't even pay attention to this. Okay, so let's go back to the drawing board. What do you think is wrong with it? Why not? Understanding what's what's motivating them and what's important to them and then go back and rewrite those things. And, and we got into a pretty good rhythm where we were able to shoot out a, a good amount of content. And, you know, we started with our baseline, like this persona with this product type of stuff. And, and by the end, we had expanded it to, you know, even new webinars that were coming up invite, uh, or I'm sorry, event invites and things like that, where we had this well oiled machine where even if we only had a couple of days before an event was happening, we knew we could put together some some um, content very, very quickly by calling together the team, you know, blowing the uh, blowing the horn, getting the team together and, and saying, okay, here's some ideas. Let's patch it up. Let's get back together, compare, contrast, take the best of everything and then ship it out. So you've essentially built a team that allows you to kind of crowdsource copy and content almost. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it, it is. And then, and we get to, and then we also have an internal team to test it as well. So we've got our We've got our crowd, like you said, crowdsource group to create the content, and then we have a, a group to to test it against as well. So we're not relying on waiting for the uh, the actual prospects to not engage or to engage. And you know, we we have we have that kind of started already, which which again, you know, we've seen. Um, um, I won't even say incremental uh, results. We've seen huge jumps in in the results that we get there because we're we're putting a lot of thought behind what we send and we're testing it against the people that we would send it to. And, and by the time it's actually shown to the customer uh, or the prospect, it's, it's already been through a bunch of edits and a, and a bunch of, a bunch of testing. So we know that it's solid. Um, and if you do that across all your channels, then you're going to have a good solid message wherever the customer or the prospect wants to engage with you, right? You, you fight them on the battlefield of their choosing. And I think that's why we still leave voicemails and, and, LinkedIn and we try text message and we try video because we need to engage them where they want to uh, engage. And we don't know that until they actually do. Right. I answer my phone. I never respond to emails. That's, that's how it is. But, you know, I know for, for every other director or person in, in my type of role, it's going to be completely different. Some of them like LinkedIn, some of them like emails, you know, uh, some of them get attracted to watching a video. I don't, you know, so, but we know everybody's different. So we expanded that to not just the email templates. Like I said, we expanded that across all the ways we try to engage with our prospects. 
I'm really curious to, to learn um, with this multi-channel strategy, what you regard as kind of key KPIs that you're constantly watching. Obviously, mm -hmm. there's the end goal of setting an appointment, but right. the instrumentation, if you will, around getting to that outcome, um, mm -hmm. what are the, the numbers and the benchmarks that you pay attention to? And, and maybe even share some of the uptick that you saw at getting messaging right of before and after. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, first part first, just the KPIs I look at. So I may be different than a lot of people in the sense that I work backwards from results. So if somebody is hitting their numbers and they're doing 20 activities a day, great. They hit their numbers. Let's talk about how you can do 40 activities a day because hopefully that will then double your results. Um, um, Whereas if someone's not hitting their numbers and they're doing 120 activities, 150 activities a day, you know, then we need to go back and look at the activities. So I've never been a guy that looks at those daily KPIs unless it's the root cause of a, of a problem or a, or a success. Um, I share this story a lot with, with my SDRs. And, and I think back to when I first started in inside sales and I was given a list of accounts and an Excel spreadsheet and a phone, right? And it was go find people to sell to. And I had a manager. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was like, here, go. I mean, I'm updating myself, but we didn't even have Zoom info or anything or Discover Org. It was Reference USA, which basically I had to have a library card to get access to. Eric's laughing because he remembers it. Harry has no idea what I'm talking about. Um, but I had Reference USA, a spreadsheet and a phone. And then that was it. And right, start going. And um, I had a manager who demanded that we made 100 calls per day. And in that particular inside sales role, that was a cradle to grave type of role. So I was prospecting as well as account management and closing deals. Excuse me. So by the time I got ramped up, you know, I would hit those numbers easily when I was prospecting 100, 150 calls a day, 200 calls a day, whatever, right? You do what you got to do to get, get some prospects. But once you start with everything else, uh, I still had this manager who was like 100 calls a day, 100 calls a day, 100 calls a day. And if I'm being honest with you, I was hitting numbers, right? I've, I've been promoted. So there's a fair assumption that more times than not, I hit my quota and, and was, was successful. But I rarely would be able to get 100 calls a day when you're talking to customers and you're negotiating deals and you're specking out different things with them and whatnot. So I had about 15 to 25 numbers that I knew would never answer. And they were legitimate businesses, but it always either went into like a, a, a phone tree loop or something like that. And if he crawled up my butt that day, I would make 15 to 20 fake calls just to placate my manager. So when I get into the role of leading, I'm like, you know what, if I did it, I'd have to expect other people would do it. And of those 15 to 20 calls, that was wasted time. It didn't, it, it didn't work to my quote. It was just to shut my manager up. So I swore when I went into management, I wouldn't be a, how many things are you doing a day type of guy, just blindly looking at the KPIs. So what I do is I like to look at the results and then move backwards from there and figure out. And, and I look at the very end result, which is opportunities and pipeline. So we can't really control pipeline because the deal is the deal, right? An SDR does the same amount of work for a $300,000 deal as they do for a $3 million deal. Um, you know, that's based on spec and everything. So I look at the number of opportunities, the conversion rates, you know, from meeting to opportunities, you're going backwards here. Um, that conversion rate of those, the conversion rate of their, of their leads to their meetings. Um, and then how many activities are, are they doing in between? And then listening to those calls and looking at those emails and figuring out, trying to dissect where along that process, there's a problem. And it becomes very easy to come coach and to, um, to help your uh, SDRs be better if you look at it in that sense, because if someone's not hitting their numbers and I just say do more activities, but they're doing horrible activities, we're not going to, we're not going to change anything. We're going to spend 30, 60 days wondering why did more activities not work? So I like to look at those, at those steps um, from, from the uh, back end, you know, all the way to the front to say, where's the problem? Where does the coaching really need to, to, to be? And what's going to affect a positive change? Um, and, and you can very easily see that, right? If the conversion rate of meeting to opportunity is significantly less than the rest of the team or what you expect, then you know that they're setting bad meetings. Okay, great. Now let's listen to the meetings. Let's listen to your qualification. Let's understand why the sales rep is not converting those. And, and let's dig into that section of the process to understand what the problem is and fix it. Then we'll look at the results again, and then we'll go fix the next thing.
sorry, you're data driven to diagnose the situation and to decide how to coach, how to make improvements rather than data driven from the front end of here are the numbers. We made the decision in advance, go hit them. We assume it'll work out. Right. You're exactly. constantly iterating based on the data. Exactly. Yep, exactly. I want I want to look at it. I want to look at it and diagnose where the problem is. Use things like KPIs and quotas and results as um, as as the the issue, but what is the root cause? So I think of it like a doctor, right? You go into the doctor and you're like, "Oh, I've got this cough that won't go away." Okay, well, what's causing that cough? Is it is it allergies? Is it emphysema? Is it lung cancer? You know, it could be something from very, very, uh, you know, nothing like allergies all the way up to something big. And the doctor isn't just going to say, oh, you've got a cough, go take some Robitussin, right? They're going to do some tests to see what is exactly wrong with you. Um, I, I, I use that example because I think of it the same way. Okay, we've got this problem, but what's the root cause of that problem? Very, very rarely is it the number of activities that they're doing. Um, it's usually the types of activities or what they're saying on their voicemails or, or phone calls, how they qualify, the content of their emails, who they're targeting. Are we using personalization in the right way? Um, you know, do we have a bum sales rep who just says no to everything? You know, what, whatever it happens to be along the way, there's usually a root problem. And for me, what I found, and again, like I said, I, I think I'm, I might be an outlier with this mentality, but it rarely boils down to you just need to do more every day. Well, it's flying in the face of the thing that is not in abundant supply, which is time. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, so tell me this though, because it sounds to me um, like at your te- ten months into your tenure at Big ID, it sounds to me like you've already kind of established a cohort norm across your KPIs and relevant conversion rates, mm-hmm. and given that you four x the team total team size. My guess is that you found those cohort norms somewhat normalized. Is that a fair read? It's getting it's getting normalized, I would say. Okay. I think you know we we were able to uh, my I, so I report into marketing at, at this particular company, and I know SDR leaders like there's always the do you report to marketing or sales? And I say, was I report to both? I have one on ones with our CRO and our CMO every week. So. Uh, the CMO technically approves my time off. Other than that, I, I have two bosses. Um, but uh, but yeah, so we're making in- incremental changes. I don't think we've normalized to a point where we can say this is the conversion rate we want um, or that we think is right. We're more doing it a- across the team, right? Is it, uh, and, and maybe this is what you meant by the core co- cohort normalization, right? Is the team all kind of converting within within a certain number of degrees or, or percentages and and uh, and all along the way? And so we have we're getting very very close to that. A lot of these, uh, you know, I, I've been here ten months. The team is now twenty, and none of them are the ones I, I inherited. So everyone is eight months ish or less. So we still have a lot of people that are ramping, and we still have a lot of new sales reps that that you know we have some process degradation or some breakdowns because they don't understand it yet. So we have a lot of these things that kind of throw uh, flies in the ointment as we go. Um, But we're able to at least identify the outliers, whether it be on the way positive side or on the way negative side, and then use that to say, okay, what are the other people doing? Um, Let's take a look at, let's take a look at that and compare these particular things. And usually it's, it's, especially with newer SDRs, it's pretty obvious, right? Somebody doing really, really good is sending out great emails and the what the emails going out from the new person are not that great. Um, um, qualification and pitching big ID and what we do, you know, we hire this whole nother conversation of our hiring strategy, but I hire people that don't necessarily have experience in this area. And so learning data privacy is something that can be very, very difficult. Um, and you're talking to people that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years, right? By the time they've reached that C level or that C minus one level, um, they're very, very versed in it. And so for a new SDR, it can be difficult. We we continue to train them and teach them. So as they ramp, they can, you know, kind of fake it till they make it. And then they can actually understand it and have a conversation around it. But, um, you know, but, but we find that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the outliers generally so far have been around just kind of the tenure of the person. Um, 
it, it's definitely, you know, we've got some system changes, some technology changes that I have so we can better measure these things and these, uh, uh, you know, conversion percentages and things like that um, and really start to build out that baseline. So like I knew the percentages at Beyond Trust, right? We were mature enough to say, I knew that our MQLs would convert to meetings at 25% and we would expect our meetings to convert to opportunities at 80% and I expect, you know, so on and so forth, right? So I knew those numbers there. I just don't have them quite at, at Big ID. So what I've been doing is, again, looking at the outliers and then kind of using what I knew in the past because uh, I keep drawing uh, uh, comparisons to Beyond Trust because it's a similar ICP. It's a similar type of sales cycle and ASP and all of those things. So we can kind of draw some conclusions to say, hey, we should, we should see things kind of in the same way. When you talk about educating your, your SDRs and them slowly learning over time uh, about mm-hmm. your space, about your industry, it's an interesting balance. And I wonder what you think about this. Uh, very often SDR leaders talk about their SDRs plateauing after eight to 12 months, sometimes because they actually know too much. They start actually selling on the phone and answering yeah. all the questions. And the person goes, great, thanks. No need for a meeting. Right. Uh, how do you approach it? How much is too much? How much is too little? How do you decide how much they need to know to yeah. do their job right? Yeah, I think, um, you know, and we ran into this with some of the people that I inherited that had been with the company for like two years and, and, and have been, you know, kind of lone wolves and doing their own thing that they were starting to do a lot of that discovery that the sales rep should be doing. Matter of fact, I had one SDR who would set the meeting for the sales rep, sales rep would show up and then the SDR would run discovery. And, you know, it was, it was completely, you know, it was completely wrong. So, um, so yeah, I think, you know, I get a little bit lucky uh, in the fact that I don't know that they can plateau in in that short of a time with with this particular industry. Um, but we also, um, you know, I also encourage some of that. So I don't think there is going too far, to be honest. Um, I look at SDRs. The SDR role is a means to an end. Um, being an SDR is a great career move, and it's a very terrible job. Like if you're doing SDR work just to fill the time and to get a paycheck, go do something else because it's horrific, right? We get yelled at, we get called names, it's constant rejection. You go days where you don't even speak to another human because nobody's replying to anything. You know, it's not a it's not a fulfilling job if that's just what you're going to do. So I look at it as a means to an end, and and I like to ask people where do they want to go and you know, 80% of the time it's sales, right? The sales development, they want to go into a closing role. So I actually encourage them to continue to learn and continue to take that discovery further down the road because they're never going to be able to complete discovery um, at any point, or right? A sales rep doesn't complete discovery basically until the PO is signed in my mind, but they're never going to be able to complete it. And they always have the easy out of, okay, great. Let's set the, you know, let's set a meeting. Let me get you in touch with my AE, et cetera. So I encourage them to try to take it as far down the road as they can, because it's a good training ground for that next step. You know, the, the handoff from SDR to AE is, is, you know, it's a discovery call or it's, it's further discovery. And, and the first thing you have to learn as a good sales rep is, is discovery and how to continue to do more discovery. So like I said, I encourage them to keep going um, as much as they can and, and ask more questions and make themselves uncomfortable. And um, I use the iceberg analogy a lot that everybody does. Uh, and I say, you know, I can hire anybody that can get the easy stuff to see above the waterline. I want the people who can get down 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters underwater and start understanding the, the real breadth of what we're uh, uh, with and breadth of what we're dealing with here. So, so, um, so yeah, so they don't, we, we don't really run into that problem of them selling too much on the phone because we're encouraging it. And, and, and to be honest, the, the situation, uh, the, the uh, product and the, and the solution is so complex that you, unless I've got a three or four year SDR, they're probably not going to get to that level of knowledge where it's going too far or they're butting right up into the demo or something like that at that point either. There's always more questions in your space. Yeah, there's always, I mean, there's always more. And, and, and we sell down three different pillars too. So there, you could always expand from a security conversation over to a governance conversation if you really want to go that direction, if you've got a person that's interested in that as well. So there's so, so much to learn and so much to know and so many different directions it could go based on what they want to do. Like I was talking earlier about all the different apps that kind of pick your own adventure that most SDR is just not going to get that knowledge level um, um, in their in their year and a half or or even two years of of being an SDR here. 
So Jason, it's pretty um, evident in our conversation that you're a pretty big believer in <clears throat> specialization of roles and kind of even experimenting with things like, you know, the research uh, role attaching, mm -hmm. you know, the content role that kind of sits not exactly in marketing, not exactly in, you know, right. in sales. Um, if we're talking again in 12 months, what will have changed with sales development? Where do you see trends kind of going? Um, is it towards the directions that you've pointed out and found success with? Yeah, I think, you know, I think the days of um, the days of the generic, this is what my company does. Can we, can I get 15 minutes on your calendar type of messaging is dead. I mean, 80% of the emails I get are exactly that format. Um, so it's sad that there's so many SDR teams and leaders that allow that to be the, the norm. Um, but I think that's to die. Yeah, slow to die. Exactly. So I, I think that's gone. I think the hyper personalization in this account based model is where things are going to go. Um, I, I've done a couple presentations to our, our executives about it. And, and I like it to the to the uh, rabbit in the uh, I'm sorry, the hare in the tortoise, right? the tortoise wins the race, but he's very, very slow. And, and, and you're not going to see that immediate like cloud of dust. And I've told that to my CEO, if we move to this account-based model with hyper personalization and hyper um, customization, it's going to be slow, but I think it's going to pay more dividends in the end. So we have to kind of trust that process a little bit. Um, uh, so I think, you know, I think that's a big thing. I, I really think we need to get back to that personalized messaging and allowing our SDRs to move slower. Um, we have enough technology that we can make up for a lot of that inefficiency in technology as well. So that's something that I'm focusing on right now is saying, okay, uh, a, an SDR using a bunch of templates in that 80-20 model that we've used, they can spit out this many activities. But if I want them to do 50-50 customization or 40-60 or something like that, then I need to I need to fix it um, in technology. So I think uh, another thing in, in 12 months, I think hopefully we'll see a lot more integration of the technologies that SDRs use instead of having like 12 different tabs open with all this fun little cool stuff. You know, I want them to have one or two tabs that has all of that stuff right there for them. So um, technology efficiency is slower and, and more um, uh, more deliberate. Um, and then I'll be honest with you, a plug for science. I love what you guys do with the personalization of the, or the separation of the roles where you have your social media expert and you have your phone expert and you have your email expert. Um, so we're bringing in the research assistants. Like you said, I uh, had a conversation yesterday. We might try out a social media person who's just going to be in charge of running LinkedIn and warming up, warming up the, the prospects that we're we're going to prospect 30 days from now, as I have the SDRs kind of planning out their next 30, 60 days. Um, we can give we can give that target to the research assistant. Research assistant can get all the info we want. We hand it off to the social media person. They can warm it up through LinkedIn, um, get the connection done, you know, get some messages out there, and then the SDR can pick that up uh, at that point if they haven't engaged yet. Obviously, if they've engaged anywhere along the way, we get that right over to the SDR. So I think that's something that's going to be a little more prevalent in the market or, or in the SDR role as well is really deciding what are people really good at. Um, I had a long conversation with John, your CEO once, and, and he was talking about that. And I was like, that, you know, after five minutes, I'm like, I'm bought in. That makes sense because I write terrible emails. Get me on the phone. I'm great. I, I don't care. You can throw whatever you want at me. Water off a duck's back. I refereed hockey for a while, so I'm used to getting screamed at all the time, right? So that's fine. But my emails aren't great. And my LinkedIn game is, you know, average at best. But, you know, so if I were to join an SDR team now, I'd say, hey, put me on the phone and just let me do that. So, um, you know, seeing if we're if we can grow large enough to do that, I think you also have to have a very large organization and you have to have enough activities to spread around enough people as well as the ROI to convince your CFO to give you that headcount to do that. But I think that would be uh, something that we would look into as well uh, as we continue to specialize and continue to customize and, and make sure that every message that goes out is completely relevant. And we're not sending just old boilerplate nonsense. Well, Jason, I think we could probably fire questions at you for another two or three hours. You're feeding <laughs> I'm good. I got time. <laughs> Really appreciate your time. You've got a lot of great insights and especially in the enterprise space, it's clear that you put a lot of time and, and thought into how you're doing things seem a little more innovative than the average program out there. So we appreciate all these insights. I know our listeners do as well. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this. And uh, did we do the plug? 
already? Did we plug your uh, your company? Would you like to give a quick pitch? I mean, I did, a quick, I did a quick pitch about it, but yeah, um, uh, uh, big ID, right? Know your data, action your data, and get value from your data. So every company out there has personal information of employees or their customers that they need to protect. Um, more regulations are coming all the time uh, to, to, to protect my information and your information, and we help you you know, not just check a box to solve that, but to really grow a, a data maturity program or a data program and, and, and work with you through the maturity. So we can start by finding what you have and then uh, and then grow from there uh, down the down the path of security, privacy and governance. So if you have any interest, reach out to me on LinkedIn, Jason Prindle, very easy to find out there, big ID, and I'll get you in touch with the right folks to tell you about what we do. Well, you guys know your stuff in enterprise sales development. I'm sure you know your stuff in that space as well. So thank you so right, much yeah. for being a part of this and <laughs> yes. uh, have a great long weekend for July 4th coming up. Great. Thank you. You as well, Harry and Eric.